Good morning. Thank you for joining us here at Westview Baptist Church on our live stream from wherever you're at, from your home, uh, from work possibly. Um, and we just uh, thank you again for joining us. My name is Aaron. I'm the worship guy here. And uh, we're going to get right into it and worship the Lord in song and give him praises. Amen. Good morning. I like that. Isn't it good to be able to sing praises to the Lord this morning? We have so much to be thankful for <sighs> that we're here and that we can, we can just love the Lord and he loves us back. 
My name is Michelle, and I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful that we as a church family can just join together each Sunday morning and just be together in, in a weird way, but we're together, so that's the best way. So thank you to our stream team for being here each and every week. We appreciate each and every one of you that's here this morning helping to lead us in worship. And if you've been a longtime Westview family member, thank you for your faithfulness. If you're here this morning and you're listening for the very first time, we're beyond excited that you've clicked on our website or however you found us, and we're just glad that you're, you're with us. So if you do me a favor and go to our website, westviewbaptist.net, and then you scroll down to the bottom, there's the little word email. If you click on that, then you can fill that out and let us know that you're with us this morning or if you have a prayer request Long-time members, brand new folks, anyone, um, that would be awesome. So today I have a few announcements. Oh, before I do announcements, I want to thank you, Westview, for coming by this past Thursday to pick up your life group material. I don't know about you guys, but I was so happy to see you. Kim and I were like doing a happy dance, just everyone who drove up. It was, I told them it was like Christmas. I was excited. So thank you guys for coming by and grabbing your your quarterlies. If you have not received yours yet, we still have some left. And if you give Kim or myself a call, we can, we can meet you at some point and, and give you yours. So I want to talk about the Summer Sack Lunch Program, which is starting this coming Wednesday. School is officially done, and now the summer has not officially here, but it's coming. But the lunch program is starting. And so would you do me a favor and please, please be in prayer for that especially this year as we have many more safety precautions intact and, you know, we're just trying to do things as safely as possible, but get, get lunches to those who, who need them this summer. So if you want to help in some capacity, let us know. We are having to schedule people for when they are able to help. So please let us know. Don't just show up because we, we can only have so many people each week doing that, but we want you to help, and we will be glad to put you on the schedule for packing lunches or driving lunches on Thursday morning. You can let Kim or Sheila Satterfield or myself know, and we will put you on that team. Um, let's see what else I have. Um, we, as a staff, have been working with our elders on a regathering plan, and we we are, um, you know, hopeful that one day we will be back in this building, and we are preparing no matter what. We are trying to, to have a plan in place, no dates quite yet, but we are, we are trying to work on that so that we can be prepared. So we will be looking forward to sharing that with you in, in the next couple of weeks. Um, and please be in prayer for our pastor search team as we continue to search for the person that God has already worked out for us. Um, we're excited. We're excited to know that God's already got it fixed. Fixed. That sounds like a, a strange word, but it's true. He's already figured it out, and we're, we're just looking through those resumes, and we just ask for your prayers as we continue the search. So I do have a few prayer requests. Um, actually, I'm going to start with the praise. We had one of our couples here at Westview that they were tested for COVID-19, and the test came back negative, and we were very relieved about that. Not as relieved as they were, but we're so thankful for that. We do ask you to be in prayer for some of our church family that have had surgeries this week and are resting at home and healing, um, and their families are taking wonderful care of them. We've had a couple of... Uh, people that are going back to work, heading back to work, and one friend is going to be working in a daycare, and there's a lot of new rules put in place, um, and just pray for that, that person and their whole team, all the daycares, as they get ready to bring children in in the safest way possible, and uh, restaurants are reopening for outdoor seating and things like that. We want to keep, keep all the businesses in, in our prayers, and relationships. Everybody has them, and we, we just ask for you to pray for those who, who are having some relationship struggles, and just pray that the Lord will help them to look to Him in all those decisions, and 
last but not least, we want to pray for those who are sick with the coronavirus and those, of course, who are taking care of them. And I do have um, a couple of folks who have lost someone this week, and we just ask that you will be with them in prayer and lift them up and uh, as they grieve and go through that grieving process that is not, not an easy thing, as we all know. Um, I was... Uh, I was thankful that Carol Schmidt, we took her Sunday school books to her at the atrium, and we may just have a Westview wing there one day. We have three of our Westview folks that are there, and they're going to be doing their Sunday school class together soon, so I think that's awesome. Who knows what God has planned for the atrium of Belleville, and uh, we just will pray that God will use them in a mighty way. So if you would join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, we just love you. And we just thank you for your love for us, your great love and sacrifice of your son, Jesus. And Lord, as you know, our country, our country is hurting today and it grieves my heart to see the pain and suffering that's going on for the people of, of our, our country, Lord. We just ask for you to console with your peace, console the families who are hurting, who have lost someone whom they love and whose life you, you value and love more than anything, Lord. We just ask for you to bring peace to our country in this time, especially, Lord. We just, uh, we just look to you for help. We fall to our knees, Lord. Help us to, to just look to you for answers and guidance and direction. And Lord, you tell us in 2 Corinthians that you will comfort those in their afflictions so that they can comfort others. When they are in any kind of affliction, we will be able to give them the same comfort that God gives us. Lord, I'm just thankful for the comfort that you give me and help me to be a comfort to someone who is going through a struggle right now, Lord. We just pray for, for the city of Minneapolis. Lord, we just pray for, pray for peace, pray for those families. Lord, we just uh, ask you to uh, show your grace and mercy to us each and every day. We ask you to be with those who are watching today. Lord, we know that they're there watching for a purpose so that they can hear your word and praise your name with us. and. If they're going through struggles, Lord, we ask you to be with them also. Lord, help us as a church to, to come alongside them if we can be of any help to them. Lord, help us as we worship today, as we get filled with your word so that we can go throughout this week and be your children and that we can be the hands of feet and feet of Jesus on this earth to everyone we come in contact with. Help us to remember that today as we worship you, it's all about you. It's nothing about us, Lord. We just, we just love you and we praise your name in your son's precious name. Amen. I invite you to come by and get one. There we are. Come by and get one. I Will by Tom Rainer. And the idea is that you will read the book and then a chapter, and then that Wednesday night we'll do a Bible study. Not this week, but starting next Wednesday night. But I want you to go ahead and grab it. There's a great introductory chapter. Come by the church. If you cannot come by but would like to have one, call me or call the church office and we'll get one to you. Okay? There's my 40 se 45 seconds, and uh, we're back on script now. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Pastor Steve, and thank you also, Michelle. Again, we invite you to stand wherever you are and worship with us and praise the Lord and give him all the glory that is due him in his house and on this day that he made. Amen.
Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy. Oh 
Savior say, my strength indeed is small, find in me, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all 
to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Father God, we just thank you so much, Lord. We bless your name. We give you all the praise, honor, and glory in this house this morning, Lord, because you are deserving of it. Lord, we declare today that this is the day you have made, that we will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, you've given us joy and mercy, Lord. We thank you for those gifts. We give, you've given us the gift of salvation as well, and that is definitely something that we do not take lightly, God. We bless you. We love you. We give you all the praise, honor, and glory. And we also bless Pastor Steve as he brings us the word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Well, good morning. I apologize for my twin brother that snuck up here a few minutes ago to make that announcement. Um, I told him he needed to wait, but he wouldn't listen to me. But So, I'm Pastor Steve. I am the transitional pastor here at Westview, and if you are a guest of ours, I'm so glad that you found us and that you're worshiping with us, and I pray that God will uh, bless your heart and speak to you in a way that only He can do. I can't do it. Uh, but he can. And if you're a regular West viewer or one of our regular viewers, uh, we are glad that you're back with us. I want to ask you to take your Bible, if you would, and find 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, this is very important today because I'm going to actually be bringing you the teaching from this Word, the message from this Word, as we read the text. Uh, it's a rather long chapter, well, 20-something verses, and, uh, but I want us to be able to walk through it Uh, as we're reading it. And so I'm going to unfold it and we'll read. So you'll need to have your Bible uh, in that spot, whether it's a digital Bible or a paper Bible, whatever you have, make sure you have it opened and ready at um, at Romans, um, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, wrong book, 1 Corinthians. I was thinking about Romans this morning. So 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Now let me take just five minutes and catch you up from where we were last week, even if you were here last week, to make sure you see Because chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians is the middle of three chapters that Paul uses to talk to the Corinthian church about food, eating food that had been offered to idols, whether in the idol temple itself or then sold into the market. And he's talking to them about this issue. There had been a word that had gone out that this is one of the things that as Christians they should not do. And the Corinthian church had sent a letter to Paul with several questions. And it appears that this was one of the questions. They had said, hey, look, we're smart. We know that that idol is nothing. These false gods do not exist. So if you sacrifice food to an idol that doesn't exist, then that means it's not been tainted. It's just food, right? It's just meat. So we know that we can eat it. And Paul replied in chapter 8 saying, okay, you have all this knowledge, but sometimes your knowledge gets in the way of your common sense. Your knowledge is not deep enough. You haven't thought about the fact that there are many people who are in your church who are new believers, or maybe they're just considering becoming Christians, who used to worship in that idol, in that temple. And they believe with all their heart that idol was real, that God was real, that God would bless them, that God would look after them. And then if they see you go into this idol temple and eat this food, they're going to think that you think it's okay too. And they may fall back into their old practices and it's going to cause a problem. So if we start at the end of chapter 8, I'm going to start at verse 8. He says, take care that this right of yours, in other words, they said, we have a right to eat it because there's nothing wrong with it. It's not, it's not idle meat, it's just meat. He said, but take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this thing that you prize so much, so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, a brother for whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, because of that truth, If food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat ever, lest I make my brother stumble. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Do you see how he just keeps right on going? Remember, there were no chapter divisions when he wrote the letter. He says, Sure, I'm free. I'm an apostle. I was pan chosen by Christ to come to you and bring you the gospel, you along with other Gentiles. And, and I am absolutely, if anyone has the right to be able to be honored, it would be me along with the others who have been chosen by Christ. Christ. I even saw him, not before his resurrection, but I saw him on the road to Damascus. A couple of other times he saw Jesus face to face, the risen Christ. So Paul begins now to do something that I think is beautiful. He is going to take their very argument. I told you, I think it was last week, I said, sometimes when you read these letters, it's like you're listening to one half of a phone conversation. 
You know, you're talking on the phone to somebody and, and, and your wife is, is listening or your husband's listening and they can hear what you're saying and they have to kind of figure out through that what the other person was saying. We never want to take that too far because if God had warned us to know, he would have given us the letter from the Corinthian church. But based on Paul's responses, we can kind of tell what it was that they were asking him. And so what Paul is going to do in chapter 9 is to lay out in his own life a parallel to what these Corinthian Christians were claiming that they had the right and the freedom to do, and that was to eat food offered to idols. I just want to remind you, for those of you that, that, that enjoy the New Testament, enjoy reading the letters of Paul, there's another place in Romans 14 and 15 where Paul talks about food that is unclean. This is not the same discussion here. The discussion in Romans was about food that, according to the Jewish law, was unclean pork, uh, fish that doesn't have scales, or things in the, in, the, in the sea that doesn't have scales, and other kinds of animals that were considered unclean. And yet Gentiles could eat those things. And Paul talks about those of us who are stronger and recognize the fact that that old law is done away with. This is not about that. This is specifically about food that was involved in idol worship. And Paul has given the, laid down the first rule, which is it may very well be that someone else won't understand your freedom, and it may cause them to stumble. So the very thing that you have done that seems so okay becomes a sin because it affects another brother or sister in Christ. And then he says, without saying it, let me give you an example from my life. And what Paul does is he says, I'm going to give you some reasons why I have the right to be taken care of, but I refuse that right, and then there are the results of my refusing that right. Because you see... There was a deeper issue in the life of Corinth church that was plaguing them. We've talked about it a little bit along the way, and now it's becoming more and more evident. It's a plague that has, that has, that has affected every church I have ever served in. It's a plague that affects Westview Baptist Church. And I can only say that because I know the human heart. I know that we are sinners. You see, the, what, the deep underlying problem with the church in Corinth was they believed that the world revolved around them. They believed that they were at the center of the world. Individually, they believed that I am responsible for myself and what I do, and if I have a right to do it, then I should be able to do it because it's my right and my privilege, and I want to do it. If it hair lips grandma, as we used to say down in the old deep south, I have the right. And then what they were doing is they were, they, were, they were the classic narcissists. They saw the world as revolving around them. And so everything that we've talked about in the first seven or eight chapters of 1 Corinthians has been tied to Paul saying, you're not your own anymore. You don't belong to yourself. You are not at the center of your world. So now what Paul is going to do is he's going to begin to show them, because one of the things that bothered them has already begun to creep up, and if we had time to go to 2 Corinthians, we would see that it comes into full bloom, and that is that the Corinthians were offended that Paul would not take money from them. Now, that seems odd in, in 21st century American culture, but not really, because whenever I pay someone to do something, they now have an obligation to me. And that was part of the Corinthians' motivation for paying Paul, so that they could kind of gig Paul into doing what they wanted him to do. And Paul said, no, I'm not going to receive pay from you. I'm going to work with my own hands. And he worked at a very menial job, making tents. And he said, but you're making us look bad, Paul. <laughs> Come on, buddy. You, you, need to, you need to act the part here. Play the part. And they were beginning to be frustrated with him. And so Paul said, okay. Verse 3, he says, this is my defense to those who would examine me. Right now, this is still kind of a hypothetical, but I think Paul is beginning to sense that the Corinthians are already becoming a little bit too big for their britches. They're beginning to have a little too much confidence in themselves and not enough in Christ. And he begins and he gives five different layers of issues that give him the, pre the, the, the permission to be able to demand that the church care for him. First one is the ordinary practice. Look at verses 4 to 7. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Does a soldier serve at his own expense? Does a guy that plants a vineyard not allowed to eat his fruit? Is someone who tends the flock not able to get some of the milk? Now, that's my loose translation of what he says. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? I've never known a soldier in active combat that has to get a second side job to buy his food. 
Who serves, who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? You're out there, you're working the vines, you get a little hungry, so you take some fruit and you eat it. It's part of the compensation of being the bearer or the protector of the vineyard. Or how about you if you're a shepherd and you tend a flock? Don't you get to get some of the milk from the goats or the sheep as part of your pay? So he says it's, it's common. So Corinthians, in one sense, you're absolutely right. I do have a right to say, I've served you, you need to pay me, you need to take care of me. Then he goes on to scriptural precedent. Do I say these things, verse 8, on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that the God is concerned? The answer is yes. Deuteronomy 25.4 originally was about taking care of the oxen. But what Paul is doing, he's saying, okay, if God takes care of the ox, guess what? He also takes care of the tender of the ox. Does he not certainly speak for our sake? Verse 10, it was written for our sake because the plowman, the guy that plows with the ox, should plow in hope. And the thresher, the guy that threshes with the ox, thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more? And then in the midst of this argument, he throws in a little hint, and we're going to talk about this hint in just a second, in the second half of verse 12. Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. He goes on. He gives the common sense approach. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple? And those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings. Everybody knew that. It wasn't just a Jewish thing in every religious group. In every religious organization, in every temple, the servants in the temple were given part of the meat that was offered on the altar to the god or goddess of the temple. So it was just common sense. It was religious custom. And then in verse 14, he says in the same way, here's the, 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 the cherry on top of all of this that, that, that he has built. He says, In the same way, the Lord himself commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. comes from Matthew chapter 10, verse 10, where Jesus said the laborer is worthy of his hire. So you see what Paul is doing? Paul is saying, okay, now this is under 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 the table here, under the surface. He's not actually saying this, but here's his meaning. He says, you are over here and you say, look, we have a right to eat this meat if we want to. And you can't tell us we can't because we know the idol doesn't exist. We're not stupid. Paul, you know, you may think you have all the answers. Those guys in Jerusalem, at the Jerusalem Council may think they know everything, but we know. We're Corinthians. We're smart. And Paul says, okay, how about me? Don't I have a right? Well, yeah, of course you do. That's why we've been wanting to pay you. Paul says, well, okay, yeah. And one says, you're absolutely right. You, I do have every one of these rights. He gives these five different areas for saying, yeah, I have this right. But look what he does in verse 15 to 18. He refuses that right. He says, yes, I may have the right, but I refuse it, and here's why. I don't want to lose a much bigger reward than anything that you could could give me for my service. Look at what he says in verse 15. But I have made no use of any of these rights. And just to make sure they don't think he's trying to kind of sneak in a backhanded, passive-aggressive sort of request for some, for some money, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. Just let me, let me say this real quick. Again, I've said this many, many times, and those of us who are, who are longtime Christians and have read the Bible for, for years and years or decades, sometimes we forget how amazingly practical this book is. I am not an expert at the Koran. I've only read a little bit of the Hindu writings. But most of those books are very, very philosophical. The Bible, Paul knew, just like if I were to come in and say to the elders or something, you know, well, I, 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 don't, I don't really want any more money. I deserve it. I probably should get more. But, I, you know, they say, well, okay, I know what you're trying to do. You're just trying to get more money out of us. And Paul says, hey, I'm not trying to tell you Corinthians I want anything. I'm writing to you saying I don't want it. I want you to understand why I don't take this pay from you. I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. All right, now we got to stop. Whenever we hear the word boasting in 21st century America, we think of bragging. Well, (laughs) not me, buddy. 
I worked on my own. I pulled myself up by my own bootstrap. Nobody had to take care of me. I took care. That is not what Paul is talking about at all. Please take your little marker, your little uh, cloth, and wipe your whiteboard of all of that. Is not. Paul, when Paul uses the word boast, it is what do I rejoice in? What do I glory in? And Paul did not glory in himself. Paul's boast was that because he was a servant of Christ, Christ would care for him. Let's just keep reading. You'll see what I mean by that. Verse 16, for if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. In other words, if I came to you on my own agenda with my own desire, I have nothing to brag in except myself. I can't claim that Christ sent me. I've come on my own recognizance. I've come on my own sense, and then I have nothing For it is necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. He said, listen, I have been mandated by God, by Christ himself, to come and preach to you. I love what I do, but it's not what I would have chosen to do. It is Christ who has commanded me and sent me. If I do this of my own will, I have a reward, the reward of getting paid. In other words, if I came to you because I wanted to come, it was my plan, it was my message, it was my gospel, then I would deserve my pay for it. But guess what? It ain't mine. It's not my gospel. It's not my message. If it's not my own will, I am entrusted with a stewardship. Now, we all know what a steward is. We talk about stewardship all the time with the giving of our money to God's work. Stewardship begins with acknowledgement that I do not own ultimately the things that I have. Everything I have comes from God, and I am cared, I am charged with caring for that and using it well for God's glory. And so Paul is using that very same word when he says, hey, the gospel doesn't belong to me. The message doesn't belong to me. Salvation is not mine to give. It belongs to Christ. Christ has sent me with his word to you, and I am nothing but a steward. I am nothing but a servant. I am nothing but a messenger boy. I have been sent to you. So what is my reward? He says in verse 18, that in my preaching, I may present the gospel free of charge. And doesn't mean free of charge in the sense that you don't pay me for it, but say there is nothing that you have to do to earn it. There's nothing you have to do to pay me back for receiving it. It is free of charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. All right, are you following me here? It's a little bit complicated, but it's, but it's very clear in one sense of the word. Paul says, hey, you said that you have the right to eat this meat. And I'm saying, look, you may think you have this right, but would you use your right to harm somebody else? In the same way, I have the right to ask from you or demand from you that you take care of me because I have come to teach you. But the last thing I want is for some young believer to think that, oh, the reason he's teaching me this is so I'll give him some money. I'm just waiting for the shoe to fall. Because if, I, if he teaches me these things and I accept them, then I have to become, he becomes my patron and I have to pay him for it. And Paul says, listen, Corinthians, your whole world is tied up in yourself at the center of your world, working as hard as you can, trying to get ahead, trying to be honored, trying to be praised, trying to have value, trying to get better than the next guy. All of these things you're working for, and I've come to tell you, it's all free. It's all free, and I am modeling for that in my life. I refuse to take advantage of the rights that I have so that I can claim the greater reward, the reward that Jesus Christ gives me for being his servant. And it is so much more valuable than anything you could ever give me. He's trying to help them see that if I, Paul, were to demand my own rights— and you didn't give me what I thought I deserved, I would be angry with you. I would feel like I had been put upon. But you know what? If I take everything as a free gift from Christ, you remember what Jesus said to his disciples? Freely you have received, freely give. If I give it to you for free, if I give it to you without you having to pay me to tell you the good news of the gospel, then you realize it is not about me, it's about the one who sent me. And so in the same way, even though you have the right to that meat, perhaps, when you don't eat it, when you take that away, it's because you love your brother more than you love yourself. 
And so the result of that refusal of the rights we see in the rest of the chapter. The key verse is verse 19. This is the pivot verse for the whole chapter. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. Paul says, because I'm a servant of Christ and Christ has sent me to you, I now have also become your servant. I'm going to fix this microphone once and for all. Hang on just a second. There. I'm going to serve you. I become servant to everyone so that in the process of serving them, not being their patron, not being their overlord, not demanding of them, but serving them, they will see that that Jesus Christ loves them with a love that is free for the taking. So what does he do? There are two groups here he talks about. To the Jews… I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law, which would be those not only that were Jews, but also Gentile proselytes, but the broader, broader world of Judaism. I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. Now, let me just stop right there for a second, because you might think to yourself, now, wait a minute. Paul was born and raised a Jew. How could he become as a Jew? Well, once Paul became a Christian, he understood that the law, the ritual laws of the Old Testament, no longer held sway. The principles behind them might, but the actual laws themselves. But do you remember what happened when Paul preached in the synagogue? Five times on different occasions? He was beaten with a whip. Forty lashes, save one. Did he have to be beaten? Could he have said, well, you can't touch me. I'm a Christian now. You have no right He could have, but he didn't. Just let that soak in for a second. He did not use his own right as a follower of Christ to refuse to take the punishment of Jewish Old Testament law for blaspheming. Why? So that he would have credibility as they watched him go through suffering. Next verse. Verse 21, to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ that I may win those outside the law. Paul doesn't mean that he fought, fell into sin with the Gentiles. Oh, you guys like to do this? I'll do it too. You like going to the temple of Dionysius? I'll go too. No, that wasn't it. But he said, I know that they don't have this understanding of this old, long centuries, millennia of laws that the Jewish people are under. And so I don't come spouting those laws to them. I live basically without falling into their sinful patterns the same way they do as a person who is not under an ancient law, but rather under God. To the weak, I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. This is the foundational reference to evangelism. You see, we cannot lead someone to accept Christ if we don't know them and their life and what they're going through and what they're facing. Believe me, I grew up in the Billy Graham School of Evangelism, and I do believe that people have been saved from reading a tract. I believe people have been saved from hearing an outline or a presentation, but I will tell you, many, many more people make true decisions for Christ Many, many more people surrender to Christ when they find a Christian who understands them, who has walked with them, who knows what they're going through, and says, God has an answer for what you're dealing with. That's called relational evangelism. It's called what Jesus did. It's called what Paul did. And it's called what we should do as we reach out to those around us in love. You see, the first thing Paul said, the first result is I have to have this agility to to get my way in, to go in and be able to share the gospel. So he goes to Athens, and he goes to the Areopagus, and he starts speaking about the unknown God that they have an altar to in their city. He goes to a synagogue, and he starts talking about Moses and the law. He talks about David. He goes to people who are not even able to pay to eat meat, and he works as a poor tent maker so that he can relate to them as he sits in the market making tents, and he shares with them and talks with them and and gives information to them and and listens to their stories and tells them how Christ's love can save them and from their their lost situation, from their hopelessness. Paul said, 
I have to have the agility to be able to work my way into the lives of others, not just so they can become my next convert, but so I truly can be friends with them, and they can see my love for them, and then they'll see the God that loves me, loves them too, and they will come to Christ. The agility. We must work in our lives to develop that kind of agility. But that agility only comes when we refuse to exercise our self-righteous rights and instead allow Christ's love for others to dominate our lives as He comes to the center of our lives. Secondly, they had to have discipline. Let me jump down to verse 24 for a second. We'll come back to 23 in just a minute. There has to be some discipline in our lives. If we are going not to put ourselves at the center of our world, not to claim our rights, not to claim our privileges, not to claim what we want, not to claim that we deserve to have a night where we can sit around and watch our favorite TV show or our favorite movie instead of meeting with or being with someone who maybe is not a believer, then, then you know, we're not going to get it done. So we have to have some self-discipline. Look at what he says in verse 24. Do you not know? That in a race, all the runners run, but only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Okay. Oh, okay. Now, if we take a, a fortune cookie approach to the Bible... And we take a paragraph for like this and yank it out of his context. We say, oh, see, Paul is afraid that he's going to lose his salvation. If you, what has Paul been talking about all this time? He's been talking about how to reach others for Christ. He says the discipline we have to have in our lives is recognize the fact that we are in a race and every day we have to train, every day we have to work. It doesn't mean that only one person is going to be saved. We know that's not true. He's talking about how do you prepare for the race so that you can be successful. It means that you get up in the morning and you go out and you run every morning, whether it's raining or snowing or cold or hot. If you want to be a marathoner, guess what? You run every day, every day. You put away that Twinkie and you eat a piece of fruit instead because you have to discipline yourself. Do I see a hand over there? It takes discipline. If you are going to be an athlete, you have to put away what you want, what you would love in order to be trained and able to do the work. So we have to have the agility to be able to get in. We have to have the discipline to be able to stay in because that athlete will spend months. Every two years, they had what was called the Isthmian Games. Fun word to say, I-S-T-H-M-I-A-N, Isthmian. I got a lift, Isthmian Games. And 10 months before the games began, all of the athletes would come to Corinth. And they would begin to train every day, every day, every day, every day, every day. For 10 months, the Corinthian people watched these athletes get ready for these big games. Only games bigger were the Olympian games in Athens. And so they understood about training and self-discipline. I do not run aimlessly, Paul said. I don't just beat the air. I don't box like this. No, I get with somebody else and I I spar. Now he's speaking spiritually, he's speaking metaphorically. But his point is, is that if I'm going to be a good spiritual athlete, I have to have spiritual discipline. Because if I don't, I will be disqualified from the reward. You say, okay, now wait a minute. What is he talking about with there? Okay, well, I'll tell you. We've already talked about it in 1 Corinthians. What is the reward for believers? It comes at the judgment seat of Christ. Do you remember back earlier in 1 Corinthians? He talks about the fact that we will build on the foundation of our salvation, wood, Uh, Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, and then the fire comes. And the reward that we get will be the reward that is a result of what we have done for Christ during our life as believers. And so Paul says, I don't want to just beat around and just, just, just do things because it makes me feel good. No one responds to Christ. No one becomes a follower of Christ. And then at the end of the day, what do I have to show for it? I've got nothing. And I'm disqualified. What is the goal? What is the goal to keep on going? That's where we go back to verse 23. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Interestingly enough, and I love the ESV, but actually the word blessings is not in the Greek language. I think they were trying to say, because it, it literally says that I may share with them in it. 
Well, in it what? So the, the ESV translates, I think there's probably a lot of truth in it. He says, I want to share in the same blessings of the gospel as they receive those blessings as well. But it's more than that. It's, I want us all to be one body together. I want, us to, I want to be able to share with them. It's not about me winning someone to Christ so that I can brag about this person that I led to Christ. It's so that we all can share in the blessings of the free love that God has for those of us who are His children and the blessings that come from being followers of Christ. Okay, so what does all this mean? Let's go back to chapter 8. Paul, we're not stupid now. We know those idols don't exist. They're not real. And so because they're not real, we can eat that meat if we want to, because we want to. And by the way, when we go to those meetings, it's for networking and, and, and building status and doing this and doing that and finding a future spouse for our kids and all those kinds of things. And it's where we get our, 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 our identity. It's an important part of our lives. And Paul says, yes, but when you do that, because you know more than you love You end up making other people fall because they're not strong enough yet to understand that that idol worship is 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 a nothing. So look at me. I could come out there and I could walk in there to court and say I demand this and I demand that and I need this. If you want to hear me preach, I have to do this and that and the other. But I'm not going to do that because I don't want someone else to stumble. Did you see back what he said in verse 12? We endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Says, I don't want to come demanding compensation so that someone who maybe is on the fringe of becoming a believer says, yeah, I don't think I'm into something that I have to pay for in order to get. So, Paul says, we have to remind ourselves that we are not at the center of our universe. Christ is at the center of our lives, or should be. And if Christ is at the center, then everything we have, we receive from Him. So that's why He could be in Corinth and refusing to be paid from them, but the church in Philippi or the churches in Macedonia are sending Him money after the fact so that He then can do the work at the next place. That was common in Paul's ministry. It's not that Paul never received money from people. He thought it was somehow another sinful means you shouldn't pay your pastor. No, that wasn't his point at all. Matter of fact, he said, others get compensation from you. Probably speaking of Apollos, who'd been the pastor after him in Corinth. So he said, it's it's not that. It's the fact that I don't, I myself, even though Jesus says, you should be worthy of your hire, I know I am, but I'm going to refuse to take it so that no new believer is confused by why I'm doing what I'm doing. And so... When you begin to get out there and get to know people who are not Christians, whether it's in your, in your apartment complex, in your assisted living home, or wherever it may be, in your, in, your, in your club, in your neighborhood, at the store, wherever you are, understand that it's not about what's convenient for us all the time. It's about what does God want us to do for the sake of His kingdom. And how can we serve in such a way that it doesn't glorify us, but it glorifies Christ? Now, next week, when we come back, we're going to go to chapter 10, and Paul is going to pull the net to, because I have a feeling these Corinthians, as they're hearing this letter, are already starting to shuffle their feet a little bit, because they've been out there throwing their chest out about how smart they are and what kind of rights they have. And Paul said, you want to talk about rights? But I don't make use of my rights because I love God, and I love the people that I'm serving more than I love myself. We'll see what he says next week. Let's pray together. Father, there is not a one of us, I know, I know, because I know my heart. There is not one of us that does not struggle with putting self on the, on, at the, on the throne of our lives. I would much rather sit on the love seat with my wife and watch TV than to go to a meeting on a weeknight for a church or for a committee or for a this or a that. I would even rather spend time with my Christian friends than taking the time to really befriend a person in my apartment complex who's not a believer and whose language is a little different than mine, a little saltier and smells a little different than me and does things that I don't do. And Father, I have to remind myself 
But you did not put me here. You did not put me here to please myself. You did not save me for me to sit back and relax and enjoy life until I either go home to be with you or you send your son back. You put me here so that I could be a light, that I could be salt, that I could be a testimony to those around me. And I pray that everyone that is listening to this today, if they are believers, that they will seriously and maybe tearfully look at how often they also, like me, put themselves at the center of their world. And may we confess and may we repent. Father, for those who may be watching this morning who are not followers of Christ, at least not yet, but they're interested, I pray that they will begin to understand a little bit more because I know how the world looks at churches. Yeah, yeah, we know about churches. All they do is want money from you. That's not the case. The gospel is free. And I pray that those who are interested to know more will drop a line, send an email to the church, to me, make a phone call, set up a time where we can talk about what does it really mean for the gospel to be free. And I pray that we will all be open to hear you speak into our hearts today. For it's in Jesus' name that we ask it. Amen. We're going to sing a closing song and be done for the for the day. We thank you for being with us today. Um, I do want to remind you again, this coming Wednesday night, we're going to do a big overview of these 20 uh, questions or 20 things that every uh, Christian should know. That will be this, this week's midweek Bible study. And then next week, we'll start in the I Will book. So you've got time to come and get one, but get it while you can. They'll be out there under the portico. You can pick one up from the resource box when you come by. All right, let's sing together, and then we'll be on our way. Thank you, Pastor Steve. Again, we invite you to stand where you are and let's praise the Lord and uh, close out the service. Amen. I was blind, now I'm seeing in color. I was dead, now I'm living forever. I had failed, but you were my redeemer. I've been blessed beyond all measure. I was lost, now I'm found by the Father. I've been changed from a ruin to treasure. I've been given a hope and a future. I've been blessed beyond all measure.
blessing, counting every blessing, letting go and trusting when I cannot see. I am counting every blessing, counting every blessing. Church on our live stream. Uh, we bless you. We just hope you have a wonderful week and join us next week uh, right here on our live stream. Thank you and have a good day.